All right, welcome everybody. Can you all hear us okay? Yeah. yeah. Audio's working? Great. All right, sounds good. So uh, glad you all are joining us. We're going to talk about the single node website today. Uh, let's see. My name is Brad. Uh, I am a web designer and developer. This is Carlos. Hi, I'm Carlos. I'm a full stack developer, Drupal developer. All right. Welcome. Uh, we are from the NCI at Frederick, which is the National Cancer Institute in Frederick. We work for the Computer and Statistical Services Group. Uh, within that group, we are part of the Drupal team. Uh, so we get to play with Drupal all day, every day. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what is the problem we are trying to solve today and uh, what we have tried to solve? Uh, this project we've been working on for the last I don't know, year and a half, two years, something like that. Uh, and it's pretty much... Uh, all on production and rolling along quite well now, but uh, we'll talk about the steps we went through and what the problem is. We're trying to solve all those good things. So uh, basically, what the problem is, is we have a lot of conferences that take place both at the NCI at Frederick and some of them even here on this campus in, uh, at the NIH. And uh, there's a ton of them. And we have to take, keep track of registrations for uh, everybody that's going to attend. Uh, and basically, it's a lot of strain on our developers. We used to set up, uh, we used to set up all of these sites using ASP uh, Classic and ASP.NET, and we would basically duplicate the sites. It was a ton of work for our developers, and it would it would take a long time. So we needed to figure out a, a way off of that, and we didn't have a CMS. There was no way for our customers to manage that content. The people who were uh, controlling the conferences didn't have any way to edit their content. Everything came through our developers. So basically, we decided, you know, what, what, what were we doing wrong? Obviously, that model was not correct. So as Bill Gates would say, hire, hire a lazy person to do a difficult job. Why? Because that lazy person will find an easy way to do it. Um, manually duplicating the sites just wasn't working. Uh, we were providing one-off functionality on each of the new sites, you know, because the customer would be like, oh, we want X, Y, and Z special features, and we would oblige because we're nice people. Uh, repetitive, it was time consuming. It took us between one and three days to manually duplicate these sites. Uh, we, know, we knew we could improve on that because, I mean, that's just asinine. So, uh, the requirements, we wanted to have each site have standardized pages that you could just basically push a button and put in a few uh, fields, of, fill in a few fields of content and pages would be created. And then we also wanted the customers to be able to create custom pages. Uh, we needed uh, to attract attendee registration so people could say, hey, I'm coming to the conference. Uh, collect abstracts, which was basically submitting a file or other form fields. We needed a, a wait list so when there were too many people attending the conference, we would have a capacity set and those, anything beyond that, people could go into a queue to be backlogged on that. Uh, cloning the conferences or conference registration so sites. Uh, reusable assets, we would always list hotels and transportation options, how do you get to the conference. So we wanted to be able to reuse those sorts of things because they were the same, very similar from site to site. Uh, visual branding per conference, uh, we have three main entities, let's think about it as like Pizza Hut, Domino's, and I don't know, Papa John's, right? So Pizza Hut might put on one conference, Papa John's puts on another. So we wanted to be able to brand per conference what, uh, what the look and feel was. Uh, and empowering the content coordinators or the conference coordinators, we wanted them to be able to edit, obviously, and user roles and permissions. So how do we do all that? <clears throat> Drupal 8, obviously. We won't get into that. We're all here for a reason. So uh, let's see. Our first option was Drupal multi-site. We've all heard of it. It's you know the, the classic model of, OK, you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G sites. You have one code base to rule them all, and then you have either one database with a bunch of prefix tables, or you have multiple databases. Well, that's just as cumbersome. You still always have to have the, you still always have to have a, a developer there to set up your settings files for each site, database configure the database settings. Uh, let's see, Apache. Well, in our case, we would have to do if you want different domain names, or if we are doing like subsections of a main domain name, we'd have to set up Apache configurations, run app scans on each new instance of our Drupal site. Uh, DNS records, load balancer configs, those sorts of things. Way too much for us to want to deal with. So the, and then of course the pros of this is that of a multi-site is that you're just managing one code base. That's a lot easier than 
running your Drupal updates on you know eight different eight different code bases. Who wants to do that? So uh, the next option would be a traditional node per page approach. You have uh, basically uh, this is the classic Drupal, right? You create a bunch of nodes, uh, you group them together, you can template them, and basically it's it's the way Drupal is meant to work. You can each each page in your site is a node in Drupal. Uh, that's a classic paradigm. The cons of this are you have lots of nodes. You have to figure out how to group them all together. We actually just came from uh, Mabumos or uh, yeah, the, the, the group module. The group session. module session just a few minutes ago. Uh, they have great solution there for that. Good session. Uh, and but it's still it's a lot more a lot more nodes, a lot more moving parts, and you know. But it is an option. Uh, more complex permissions and access control. You uh, we use a lot of web forms, so you have to worry about associating your web forms as well with those groups or sites, if you will. Uh, and it's a fragmented editing, editing experience in a sense because in each conference, the content manager will have to go edit each page individually uh, versus you know, other options might bring it together in a cleaner solution. Which brings us to option number three, the single node website. Uh, the pros of this are that you basically have simplified permissions and access control. In this model, if, you're having, if you have one node that creates an entire site or microsite, you only have to grant a user that you want to be able to edit that permission to that single node. That's a lot easier to deal with. Uh, cloning, you can clone that single node. To, if you're say, oh, I want to repeat this conference again in six months, clone it with a clone module, you're good to go. Uh, conference theming, which is or branding for each conference, you can basically say, okay, I want to, you have the select menu maybe, and say, I want to choose Pizza Hut for this, for this guy and I want to choose Papa John's for this conference. And they, then you use basically CSS to style that conference in the, in the back end uh, when, that, when that conference renders. Uh, you have, of course, easy CRUD, create, edit, you know, update, delete, those sorts of things. Uh, you, each site is already grouped together. All of the nodes are in that single node. Uh, all of the pages are in that single node. So there's no moving back and forth from all the different nodes. The cons, complex uh, custom modules. We used uh, a handful of them in order to accomplish this. Uh, lots of data for one node. Uh, validation, if you have, if with so many fields, you're probably gonna wanna do things like hiding and showing fields to make the editing experience simpler. And uh, when you do that, when you go to save that node, you might have validation issues because you might have hidden fields and something might not be valid and you would then have the challenge of how do you display that to the user to say, hey, you need to go fix this. Any uh, source code changes, of course, affect all of the sites uh, in your Drupal instance, but that's also true for Drupal multi-site, so it's six to one, half dozen to the other. Um, also, we did have a great session this morning by uh, Jim, and he, uh, he talked about uh, ECK the ECK custom, custom entities. I just wanted to give a shout out to him. Uh, if we had seen that session last year, we probably would uh, you know, have a few things to take away for this solution as well. Uh, but you can see basically the workflow up here showing you that at the top you have the content type and then beneath that you would create a node off that content type. And then within the dotted box, you'll see uh, basically our dynamic routing, uh, which is, these are basically different components in our setup that would, you know, deal with the node to make it turn into multiple pages. We'll get more into this in a few minutes, but uh, theme pre-processing and twig templates. Using all of these things, you can then render out multiple pages to uh, create yourself a microsite. So, the winner is, get it? Just making sure you're awake, it's late in the afternoon. Uh, <laughs> so it's the single node website, obviously. Uh, let's see, about the solution, just as a quick rundown, we're gonna get into more detail about a good many, many of these things. But we used uh, a boatload of modules, including, well, obviously Composer, MariaDB is our database, uh, contrib modules, including access control, add to calendar, better exposed filters. I won't get into all of them, uh, but entity clone, as I already mentioned. Uh, I, I have rules on here crossed out, and I want to say that we did start this whole process off using rules, uh, but we actually ended up going away from rules. We found later on, after we had so many like, things being triggered by actions, it became really cumbersome for us to manage all of that in the rules module and in the admin interface, so we ended up moving all of that into custom code in modules to uh, basically do what we wanted to do, but with code. So rules is a good option. We just ended up going away from it in the long run. Same thing with views mode or view mode page. That was a really helpful module for us. 
Uh, we all know what teasers are. That's considered a view mode. And you can create additional custom view modes. So the view mode page module basically allows you to assign routes or paths to, or sub, sub paths to a view mode to say, hey, you know, I want this to be a page. So uh, it, it's basically addressable like any other node or page in Drupal. Um, and again, we used that for a while, and then we ended up going away from it when we uh, got more advanced with our custom routing modules in the uh, back end. Uh, so then brings us to the custom modules on the top right. We have uh, calendar tokens, conference archives. These things are just kind of setting up data for us. Uh, the date range, again, that's calculating date ranges for each of our conferences for easier display. Driving distance calculators to find out distances between like hotels and uh, conference venues, those sorts of things. Uh, and our dynamic pages rep module, that's kind of our uh, specialty there, which is basically creating all the pages from the contents of our node, our single node. Uh, data exports, those sorts of things. Uh, and then we have a variety of themes. But let's uh, go on further here. All right, I hand it over to Carlos. Hey guys, um, uh, thanks for joining us. I, I'm surprised of how many people were interested in this um, session. This is my first time I'm talking to more than five people at a time, so I'm gonna <laughs> try to not ruin it. So, but no, no promises, of course. Um, as um, Brad uh, told you, described you the, the initial scenario, uh, we had a lot of uh, different sizes of uh, conferences throughout the year. So we, the initial step was to assess all the, the past conferences and see how big or small they were. So we ended up um, having uh, like a, a, a bucket as big as possible to try to fit all the, the future um, conferences. So uh, we identified a fixed um, set of uh, pages. We had, of course, like a home page, a location page where you can see the venue um, information. We needed an agenda to see all the, the, the schedule for uh, each one of the days that the, the conference had. Uh, hotels, accommodation, uh, uh, to, to list, of course, all the, the, the hotels and transportation within to, to get to that conference. Uh, and uh, some other uh, pages such as security uh, uh, information and our registration and abstract submission um, web forms. We also gave them uh, the ability to generate up to three custom pages using paragraphs. So I think that that kind of determined how um, our, our bucket and how um, we are trying to fit as many size, uh, as many conference from different sizes in the same content type. Our, um, <laughs> our content type, our conference content type, ended up having um, up to like 85 different fields. Uh, it, this sounds like huge, but um, most of them are uh, check boxes. We use um, sim simple input um, fields. But we also use a lot of paragraphs for multi-value fields and ECK entities for um, entities that we could reuse within all this um, um, set of conferences. Uh, right here, you can see the the what the content type looks like without any uh, admin admin tweak template. On the left side, you're going to see a crazy amount of fields listed one beneath the other, below the other. And of course, this user experience would be awful. What we wanted to achieve, we have a, we have a background um, um, within a UX group in the company that we work on. So we kind of know the stress the user has um, when, he, when he's um, trying to interact with an admin page or even navigating a, 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 a website. So we created a Twig template uh, that with the idea of uh, making the user's life easier, uh, we grouped, we made um, chunks of fields or field sets uh, that made more sense for the user to interact with. And bottom line, after a like a couple of minutes or, or um, um, of, of actually clicking around the, that um, admin page, the user would have an idea of where to find um, each thing. 
Uh, we used JavaScript to generate also um, interaction with the fields. I mentioned a lot of um, checkboxes. There's field sets that are hidden, and they're um, just um, available when you enable or check a checkbox. For instance, let's let's say you don't need you you want to um, add registration to a conference, so you need you just need to check a checkbox, and then suddenly you're gonna see ten more fields that are gonna either configure your um, registration process or uh, request um, text that um, it's going to be rendered in the, in the front end. Um, we also used um, J, uh, jQuery to add um, uh, tabs. Of course, this to try to group the, the fields in, in the best way possible. And um, of course, we used a lot of um, paragraphs and ECK entities. Um, the Twig templates, the suggestion of um, uh, this different Twig templates uh, are based on uh, uh, pre-process logic. Every time, let's say, a node edit form is uh, uh, loaded, a pre-process is suggesting to use um, our, our template. So every time you click on add a, a conference node, you're going to see uh, this, uh, this collection of fields, but using our, our um, Twig template. We also uh, suggest a lot of templates for different fields, such as the paragraph fields or the ECK entities, because um, they are a collection of uh, fields that could be uh, messy to show as a, as a list. And again, we tried to group them in the best way possible to make the, the user experience better. And if you can see in the uh, screenshot on the left, uh, we have a, in the top right corner, we have a, a quick facts um, box that has a lot of um, data related to that conference. We also use the pre-process function to make all that uh, information available so the user could have a quick peek of uh, what the the starting date of the conference was, the, the closing date, um, which um, were the, for instance, the URLs to the registration form or the, or the uh, for instance, the, the capacity of, um, of that conference. Uh, and right here we can see, like, side, side to side how the user, the, the node edit form looks like and the front, the homepage of one of our conferences um, looks like. Going back to, the, to what I uh, uh, mentioned earlier, we grouped, we tried to group the fields in a way that um, made more sense for the user to interact with. We have a set of global fields that determine uh, global configuration and global um, um, uh, data, such as the, the title, you can see how one field renders in our header, our conference header in the, in the right um, screenshot. You can see how uh, also we have a paragraph to, to add um, contact, um, points of contact, and it's also rendered in the right side, in the left sidebar. And let's say Brad mentioned branding. We have a select box that allows us to select um, the branding of the conference. Can be uh, CCR, uh, well, Center for Cancer Research, Frederick National Lab, or Nash National, National Cancer, Cancer Institute. Uh, those are global uh, um, configuration fields because they determine how the, the conference, is, uh, the page is going to look. Uh, for instance, if you pick a different um, uh, value for the branding field, your, the, your conference is going to look different, and um, it's going to show you different things depending on the configuration fields you, you use. In the bottom side, we have page-specific fields that are related to the, the page content. So each one of the tabs, or most of the tabs, have uh, a group of uh, fields that are 
related to one single page in your front end. So you're going to see a tab that, um, uh, that handles all the agenda fields that are, are going to be rendered in the agenda field in the, right, um, in the front end side of the, the conference. You can see like the example, we are rendering a title, we're rendering a body field, and we're rendering uh, an image within the, the, the center area from our um, page. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have a, a laser pointer, so this would make, that would make, make it easier. And here you can see the amount of Twig templates that we use to render one single um, page. We have an HTML uh, template that defines all the, like the high level markup, such as the, the header and the body field of our page. We have a page template that handles um, the global styling for our conference. We have a sidebar template that is consistently being shown in the left side of, our, of every one of our pages and of course contains a very defined set of, um, uh, of information. And our node template that is the one that we use uh, to render the different type of um, uh, fields depending on the, the, the page type that we define and I mentioned in the, in the first um, uh, slide. In this case, we, we have an uh, uh, overview page, we have an agenda page, we have a location page, and each one is, is using a different template to show uh, different information and a different structure within the, the, the center area of our page. All right. So here we have, uh, I'll explain real quick how we also archive old content. We mentioned that conferences, uh, the, the, the main point of these sites are for us to gather conference registrations to see who is attending. Well, one of our main concerns as well when we got into all this was like, there's sometimes conferences that have thousands of attendees, uh, and, and some of them might only have you know 30, but uh, it varies widely. So we put on 60 to 100 conferences a year, and that's, now that could be tens of thousands of registrations through a web form per year. We're using the same web form on all of our conferences. So uh, basically, we could have a boatload of, of you know, conference registrations. And not only that, but each time we want to find out who is attending a conference, we will go and we will basically run a query and export. I mean, it's automated, scripted, and all that good stuff through a module, but uh, you will go and you export the attendees for that conference. So we'll have to query all of those, uh, all of those submissions. So basically, uh, what we do is ev at, we know the start and end dates of a conference. So 30 days after the end date of the conference, a cron job will pick up that the conference has ended, and it will then basically uh, set a flag on that node to say that the conference is archived, which sends it to the second, the second tab on the workbench dashboard so that it's out of the content or the content manager's main view. And then we take, and you'll see these icons there, uh, we basically take all of the web form, exp we take all the web form submissions uh, for that conference, export them to a CSV file or a zip file, depending on how registrations work and if there's attached files and all that good stuff. And, uh, and then we basically delete all those, all those uh, web form submissions. That keeps us running lean and uh, you know, basically without a bunch of uh, you know, heavy, heavy weight in the database. Uh, next up is how do these uh, components all communicate? So uh, this is a really simplified version of what happens when you request a conference page. Basically, on the left, you see the orange computer that somebody makes a request for a page. Uh, basically, that request comes into Drupal, obviously, and the dy our dynamic routing, our dynamic page module picks up that request, uh, and it basically looks at the URL, finds out uh, based on our routing YAML files and uh, URI val validation, basically. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. But, uh, and then it'll suggest a Twig template and provide any theme pre-processing that we need. Uh, and it goes then to the, comp to the node, gets all the data, brings all the data from that node back, and sends it back along to the, uh, to the browser 
to render it all in the page. Uh, did I miss anything on that one? Okay. So this is where the magic happens. This is not something that uh, it's like out of the box. We are trying to trick Drupal to think that each one of our um, type of pages exists within Drupal. But what we are trying to, to, um, to what we accomplish is to uh, have dynamic routing and each one of the, the, the pages would have like a, like a virtual URL and a pre-process function that would retrieve all the, all the data and send it to a, to a Twig template. We're using uh, route, uh, this method called um, route callbacks that is uh, built into um, Drupal um, um, routing um, uh, like system. Uh, Drupal uses a YAML file. Uh, it's routing.yaml file to declare valid paths to, that your module uses to, um, to generate valid pages. The file function is just to pair paths with controllers. So for each one of our um, valid pages, we are triggering one, one um, controller. Uh, again, in, in this case, for our project, we don't have fixed paths. So that's why we, um, we use the, this um, method to, to make this um, um, all work. And when, when he says that we don't have fixed paths, we basically allow uh, the user to set URL paths in the node. So we'll actually have fields on a per page basis. Am I jumping ahead here? No, no. Okay, no. but yeah, so we have fields on a per page basis to say, oh, I want the agenda page, really I want the URL to be uh, events or something. And the user can then change that in the node. And then that's where our, that's what he's saying, our module will pick up on that and incorporate incorporate those into the routes. Uh, we also have a dynamic um, routing controller. Uh, you can see that we are registering all the existing conferences that we have and adding a variable to the, to the route. So in this case, whenever uh, 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 an HTTP request is done to one of those um, paths, a trigger is being, um, um, uh, uh, sorry, a controller is being triggered. Uh, and after that, a, route, uh, a, a new route collection is, is sent. You can see the dynamic page controller has a method called, called content that is the one that I'm gonna talk about next. This file does a simple validation. The first step uh, is to generate an array of all the pages, all the page types we have in, in our conference and assign them um, the field value that is related to that, um, to that page. Our second step is to grab the page variable from the, from the URL. In this case, it's the last segment of our um, um, URL. And it follows that exact same structure. We grab the, the, the last segment, and we basically do a validation. We validate that va the, the value of that variable and search for that value within um, the array that we created. Uh, after that, if we found the variable, we return a, a, a theme suggestion. Uh, I'm, in, I think that this also is an important thing to say that all of our um, um, themes have an, an attached um, pre-process function and a tweak template. That's the way, that's the way um, uh, uh, this all works. I'm gonna elaborate on that um, in the next um, uh, uh, slide. And um, the other alternative is if the value is not found within that array, we are um, returning a not found HTTP exception. So we are actually telling Drupal that we reach a 404 page. So now that we have an array, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that we have a, a, a theme suggestion, the preprocess function is going to be triggered. I'm gonna talk about a specific example about uh, our, uh, how our agenda preprocess function works. Uh, let's say we, all this like dynamic page validation happened and our theme suggestion was agenda. So 
our agenda preprocess function is going to trigger and basically is going to go to our node, um, uh, uh, our conference node, and grab two fields, in this case, very specific fields. We have a paragraph called conference day that um, stores um, all the, the, the day, days we have within a conference. And we have a, a nested paragraph in, in each one of those um, uh, items that is called, uh, that stores all the events in that particular day. Uh, after grabbing all the information, we're just like putting together a new array with with, uh, with uh, um, uh, all the, the conference days we have and each one of the, co the events within um, each day. And we made that array available in our um, variable, um, uh, uh, in our variable array. Renderer. In a render array. <laughs> The last step would be the Twig template rendering of the required um, fields. In this case, we have two options, and it, it happens in the, with, with this particular example of the agenda. We can, the, the Twig template is rendering both direct field, the value of uh, field values directly and rendering, rendering them in the template, and um, it's also using the, the array that, we, uh, uh, that, that I explained um, uh, in the last uh, slide to generate a list of all the, 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 the days in a, in a conference and the events in each one of those days. Uh, and after that, we are uh, adding some sort of interactivity using um, J, uh, slick JS, so we use that information to generate like a, some sort of um, carousel that can um, allow the user to, to um, uh, have different slides to see all the events in each one of those days. Okay, so access control, we talked about that earlier on, is obviously an important component. Uh, how do you control access to each of these nodes or conferences, if you will? Like I said, we had a really simple approach by doing the single node approach. Uh, we basically used uh, traditional roles to just say, hey, we have a conference admin, well, you, of course you have your super administrators, the people who create, created all of this. Thank you, Carlos, and you know. Uh, <laughs> and then conference administrators who can uh, administer any conference, and then as well, like a conference author who might have less control, they may, may not be able to create conferences. Those are just our traditional roles that we created. And then we also wanted to be able to enable people like conference authors to access specific conferences and not uh, all conferences. And that's where we use the access control module, which you see in the screenshot on the right. And we there's more fields to the access control module where you can uh, add different, uh, different levels of permissions. But we only wanted to be able to enable uh, you know, users to basically edit. So we hid some of the other options with the access control uh, module on this page. So that was really basic. Uh, domain names. Uh, we, you may or may not have noticed, probably not, we didn't really show it specifically, but in our solution, we basically have done what you see under the first bullet here, under A. Uh, all of our conferences are under a single domain name. That's for us, ncifrederick.cancer.gov. And so, all of our sites were just subpaths of that uh, of that domain name, so we didn't really have a lot of issues with domain routing. Uh, if a lot of you folks might be interested in uh, microsites in this in the sense that you might have individual domain names for each of those microsites, there are other solutions out there. Uh, things like uh, modules like. Uh, domain access and microsite and micronode. Uh, there's a couple of good articles, which I, the one here at the bottom was one of the ones that kind of helped a good bit uh, in our initial research, which basically went through, I believe, the microsite and micronode modules. Uh, those modules have a lot of supporting modules as well that allow you to do uh, different things. And I believe, like I said, the session that we just came from uh, about um, I'm sorry, about the groups module, exactly. That uh, obviously has a lot of uh, support for domain access and those sorts of things as well. So if any of you are looking for a solution uh, that uses multiple domain names, there are different solutions out there and help to be had. Again, we didn't have that uh, challenge, but I can see who, how people could. Uh, so how about our successes and failures? Uh, some of the good things that came about, uh, or I'm sorry, some, let's start with the bad things and on a good note, right? 
Uh, the bad things, we did lose data at some point. Uh, <laughs> we missed the mark once or twice, and uh, we did end up having to recover. Uh, I think, what was it, like our archive module ended up yeah. deleting a bunch of web, for, or web forms, web, that, registrations. web registrations that we weren't supposed to. So we, we, you know, we had a few snafus, uh, oops. <laughs> but uh, and in security updates, we had a few troublesome modules that would uh, give us, you know, flack every time we tried to update them, and and eventually we fixed all of that by going to better, more and better custom code. Uh, but you know, it happens. Uh, Composer was definitely a learning curve for us. Uh, we we kn have known how to use Composer, but I think with this solution, we have gone, you know, much heavier and further with it. So. That was a challenge to us, um, and we had to, we we rewritten a lot of our custom modules several times, uh, as much as our manager probably didn't like it, but uh, <laughs> it had to be done. There were better ways to do it, and you know we couldn't just ignore that. Uh, and of course, the fun of coming to Drupal GovCon is that now we have a bunch more ideas too. So uh, I'm sure they're going to love that. Uh, so the good thing, uh, we saved so much time. Uh, our old conferences, we would probably uh, have, let's say we have 60 conferences a year. Uh, let's average it at 12 hours a conference of effort for one, of, one or some of our staff members. Uh, that's 720 hours a year that our staff was spending on uh, the way we used to do conferences by doing them in .NET and duplicating them manually and, and so on. Uh, nowadays, th with this setup, we have, let's say we still have 60 conferences a year, our guys can usually set up a new, our, our content managers can usually set up a new conference in about three hours, give or take. That's down to 180 year, hours a year. That's a 75% reduction in effort on our, on, on our content managers. So uh, definitely a benefit there. Our customers are super happy to be able to edit all their content and we've given them a ton of options to just be able to go in and click around and configure things the way they want. Uh, let's see, last year at GovCon we attended uh, for you know, the nth time and there were so many sessions that helped like, give us ideas and get, validate uh, everything that we were doing. Uh, and again, I feel the same way about it this year even though it's already built. But uh, yeah, so, uh, and then finally our toolbox has grown. Uh, you know, we, we reuse a lot of our, our components and our, our, our programming across other sites that we're building now. And it's such a it's such a great thing to have you know to, to be growing in this way, um, and of course we just learned so that's a good thing. Uh, finally, uh, are there any questions uh, out there? Uh, you all are obviously welcome to contact us after the fact, but uh, if there's any questions, I'm at it. Yes. So I have two questions actually. Mm -hmm. So first question: I saw you have a custom pages section. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with uh, templating those custom pages? So <coughs> I guess you know what the structure should look like, but uh, how much flexibility do you give to your users for building custom pages? How many custom pages do you have to use? Absolutely. Question. The second question, in the beginning you mentioned that you use JavaScript to hide and display uh, different fields based on the states of checkboxes. I also saw the uh, <coughs> module in the list. So why do we use the conditional fields? The, the, uh, the conditional fields module? Yeah. Um, so I'll repeat your questions real quick so that we have it on tape. Uh, the first question was uh, the custom pages and how we manage the custom pages, how do we template the custom pages, those sorts of things. Uh, and then the second question was why do we have conditional fields module uh, <coughs> when we are using JavaScript to hide and show some fields. Um, in terms of the custom pages, we basically we use paragraphs, and in this case, I, I have a multi-part answer for you. In, in this case of these conferences, we use a really basic paragraph that basically has a WYSIWYG field in it and a URI field for the page, and, uh, and, and a title field, right, to say what the title of the page is. And basically, uh, we have one twig template to rule that, to, to, to render that, and it's it just basically does whatever you put in the WYSI WYSIWYG field and puts the title on the page. Now, in addition to that, we have, on more recent projects, uh, taken that a lot further and uh, set up like a rows and columns and uh, blocks sort of model where you can use paragraphs to add a row and then add columns within that row and then add blocks within those columns. Uh, and in that case, uh, we've used more of like a... What uh, what's the uh, we use to to render and column render our columns and uh, with flexbox and all that good stuff to make everything look nice, but really it's ultimately in that model it's up to the customer to to set like the column widths 
and then to choose the appropriate blocks that they want. Uh, and so again, it's still kind of really basic twig templates, uh, but it's a more complex setup for the user to be able to configure whatever they want. Um, in terms of the conditional fields module, uh, yeah, Carlos? I think that, uh, we, just, we started using this module, but um, we ended up having very, it wasn't that flexible and it wouldn't allow us to like to have the, the, the exact interaction that we needed with different fields so that's why we ended up um, using a plain um, jQuery um, uh, code. So that said, it sounds like we probably don't use it anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah we don't use it anymore. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Yes? Uh, question about the uh, use of views. Have you ever thought about using contextual filters to render some of the like a specific content, like the, you know, and, and context arguments, mm -hmm. just to render some like sidebar content, or as opposed to writing uh, custom controllers and wrappers? Yes. So. The question is, uh, have we ever thought about using views and contextual filters to render things like sidebar uh, in, in a contextual way on a per conference basis? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And we, we haven't done that necessarily with our sidebar because in this instance, because of kind of the stricter nature of these conferences and, and the our powers that be that want it to be a certain way. But uh, we have definitely used contextual, we actually use contextual views with, uh, we were talking about the uh, registrations for attendees. Uh, like I, I said, or I mentioned earlier that we use the same registration form on all conference sites, and so we're actually on the admin side using contextual filters to filter down the registrants for each individual conference and display those up to the to the admin folks so they know who's attending. Um, and I agree. I I think that we're, our initial uh, mindset was keeping everything simple and use like uh, contextual filters and stuff like that, but as the project would go um, like gr keep go growing we kind of saw that we had a lot of moving parts so we tried to make everything work uh, by using um, more um, custom modules yes Hi, uh, thank you for showing this so I had a question about you all's foreign validation mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a really great question. I'll repeat it uh, again. She's saying how how do how we handle field validation, form validation, uh, and training the customer to make sure that everybody like that a you know things are successfully submitted. I, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, and and how do we keep the customer doing it correctly and all those good, good things? Uh, I'm sure Carlos will follow up here, but honestly, a lot of most 95% of our fields are optional. And uh, in, in this in this solution, and we basically use a lot of logic in the pre-process functions and in the uh, in the custom modules to say, okay, if X field is, and, and we had mentioned how like we have like check boxes that might hide or show other fields. Uh, those also work to say what to render on the front end. So let's say we enable register, or we haven't checked the box to enable registrations. Well, we don't, we, not only do we not show those fields in the admin side, and they're not required, so it doesn't throw validation issues, but then on the front end, because that checkbox isn't checked, if somebody were to, like, it, it not only does it not render the link to the registration page in our uh, navigations, but if somebody were to try and visit the navigation, or the registration page at conference name slash registration, uh, we then use our, our custom routing module throws a 404 error uh, you know, an actual, you know, a real 404 error, not just the page, and, uh, and and doesn't allow the person obviously to access that page, nor will it, nor will it get indexed or anything like that. Um, yeah, and um, again, yeah. the fact that we don't, or most of our fields are not like required, made it easier. Um, and maybe the only field that we actually sanitized and validated and and tried to clean it as much as possible with is the one that we use for. Um, uh, for the, the the user to define the the, the, uh, URIs. the dynamic URIs. That's the only thing that we needed to validate in order for not to allow them to put input um, like strange characters or um, um, 
duplicate uh, uh, values within two pages. And um, it was a painful process for the user, even though that I think that we did a very good job on like grouping um, fields and adding tabs and, and adding uh, interaction. It was a painful process for to, to, to train them to, to use the, the, the tool, but after a couple of months, they're, they're totally happy and they're on their own. I, I think that we haven't really provided a lot of support, right. maybe just for new features, so that's, that's good. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. how, how large is, the, is your client, by the way? How many people are building these features? Uh, that's a great question. Well, in terms of the actual content administrators, I mean, it's probably less than 20. Uh, we have a, a web support staff that there's about three or four folks that uh, will deal with building or might deal with building conferences, mainly one or two. And then uh, we have some folks within the individual institutions that run the conferences, and that's maybe another handful of people. Uh, and then there's randomly other people that might come in if they're like, oh, I'm the PI in charge of this conference, they might want to edit their content or something along those lines. So then we have those one-off people. But I mean, at any given time, it's probably no more than 20, but it varies as time goes on. You know, some people will disappear and some people will come yeah. on. And so. I think that the important part is that we're capable to allow them to to have new administrators, mm -hmm. so the, the the page, the, 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 the our Drupal instance is prepared to do that in case they need it. So yeah, yeah. you had a question. Yeah, I think I saw a question up here on the stairs, real quick. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering if your PIA um, performance concerns with this type of setup, especially with all the pre-processing, pre-processing you're doing in the back end. Yeah, uh, the, so the question is, do we have performance concerns about any of this? Uh, it, not really, honestly. We've found that it's running really smoothly. We haven't had a lot, you know, knock on wood, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it really hasn't been a problem. We were concerned about having the number of fields in a single node that we have, uh, but it really, it really hasn't been problematic for us. Everything's been running pretty, pretty, pretty swiftly. Uh, the, our big concern did come in, like I was saying, with all the web forms and having to query like so many web form submissions. Uh, and again, we solved that just by archiving or removing old, outdated uh, submissions. And again, uh, yeah, it, it really hasn't been problematic for us. Yeah. Yes? I'll follow up on that. Uh, the re since the conference registrations are archived and then removed, mm -hmm. like deleted, I assume, after yeah. that form, can attendees register for subsequent conference and reuse information from a previous registration? Is that even a use case that you need to cover? Mm -hmm. And also, Custom routing module, something you might contribute back to DWL or this as a install profile. I'll repeat the question and then I'll let Carlos take a take a stab at it. So, uh, is uh, you know when art? I'm sorry. So when we're archiving the web form submissions, uh, what, can you repeat the rest uh, of the Can a registrant and a future oh, right. thing? Do it again? Can the registrants reuse or register the next time and reuse their data, those sorts of things, and then as well, uh, will our custom routing module uh, be contributed to Drupal at some point? To Drupal contrib at some point. Um, um, the first one. Uh, that's not a, like a use case, reusing registrants. I think that we, we could do that because it's not that we just delete them. We, we of course, cre create um, a CVS file, CSV file uh, for, with, the, with the registrations and a JSON file just in case we need it. Um, if, if we lose some um, registration or something so we can, we can recover them. Uh, but yeah, it's not, it's ha it hasn't been a requirement yet. And um, yeah, the, we would love to, to share this with the community. Uh, but I think that this particular module is exclusive for the needs that this project had. It's not generic enough so we can um, share it, but um, we actually are excited of um, eventually grab some of our like ideas of dynamic routing and, and putting a more generic module that could actually work with, with, uh, with whatever um, side you need. Oh. You may have answered this, but um, if you have the same conference every year, and they fall into that conference, it's Yeah, so if, they, if we clone a previous year's conference, I didn't catch the end of that. Uh, just how does it work? 
Yeah, so basically what happens is, uh, the question is, if we clone a conference, how does that all work? And, and basically what happens is we use the entity clone module, I believe, and since it's a single node, it's easy to, to clone it. Uh, but what we do do is, as we clone it, we use a hook to basically uh, strip out any specific fields that we feel aren't, uh, that aren't required for the next year. So let's say the, the date field for the conference, we would strip that out. We would strip out the agenda events. The uh, registrations. The registrations, we make sure that those are all cleaned out and not associated with the new node. I mean, they wouldn't be anyways because it's like a, it's based on node ID, but uh, a registration or web forms are based on node ID that they're submitted on. So that's not a problem. But um, yeah, so basically we do, uh, we do sterilize it a bit. We get rid of anything that would be specific to that specific instance of a, of a, of a, of a, of a conference and, uh, and then we keep everything else like the conference name and, uh, you know, and all that good stuff. And then of course we allow it to have a new conference. We app append like a dash zero or dash one to the URL to make sure that like it doesn't have a, a duplicate, uh, con a conflicting like a URL. URL yeah. Exactly. So yeah, we do do some cleanup as we clone conferences, but, uh, other than that, it's pretty much just a straight, uh, entity clone module usage. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can you say it one more time? Is this, uh, so you're saying so with the dynamic routing when you request this? Uh -huh. Yes, it is. A, it is a full postback, I believe. It's not. It's not like a j JavaScript thing or anything. It is actually a whole new page load. <laughs> I'm sorry. And by the way, for the recording, the question was: with the dynamic routing, if uh, when somebody goes to a new URL, does it refresh the whole page or does it just reload part of the page? And it is, in fact, a full p page reload. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it.